Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live. My name is Kim Case, and I'm so pleased to be here today with Peggy George. Lorna Cosentini is out at a family event today, uh, but she will be returning um, on the 30th with us. And we're going to be talking today about Summer of Making and Connecting. And we have some special guests with us, Christina Cantrell, Paul O, Paul Allison, and Karen Fossenthor. So I will be, they will be introducing themselves in just a bit. We want to welcome you because I know that there's been some difficulties with weather throughout the country and with the end of the school year and the beginning of summer, we're so glad that you're taking time to join us. And we want to let you know that all of the resources that are shared today will be included in the live binder, including the links that are shared throughout the session. They'll be added after we all exit and the recording has processed. Our Live Binder link has been posted in the chat, and we have also been nominated for the Live Binder Top 10 contest, so we'll be talking about that a little bit later at the towards the closing of the show. We want to let you know that all of our sessions are recorded and posted to our blog post page on the Archives and Resources page of our website each each week, so you can always go back and listen to the recording, and I'll, we'll be talking about a way you can subscribe to iTunes or using an RSS feed. Right now, we'd like to know where you're joining us from throughout the world. So right now, if you could click on the second icon, which is the laser pointer, and then drag that out and click on the location on the map as to where you're tuning in from. We always love to see where our guests are uh, participating from throughout the world. I know Shambles Guru is in Thailand. I don't see his little uh, whatever you call it, sunburst thing, but I know that that's where he is. Peggy's in Phoenix and I'm in San Antonio and next week we won't have a show, but we will the following week because we will be at various events with ISTE. So we're excited about that. That's okay if you can't find the the icon, the little laser pointer. You can always type it and then put in the weather. Uh, so far, the weather here has been um, in the high 90s, lots of humidity and lots of rain. So um, if you could... You might want to bring an umbrella next weekend if you're coming to uh, ISTE. Check the weather and make sure. Or you can always uh, send me a tweet and I'll tell you what the current weather is that day. Okay, we're going to go on and do some polling questions now. And you will vote just below your name. You won't be voting on the whiteboard. And the first polling question is, have you participated in any MOOCs? And the MOOC is a massive open online course. If you could vote and click on the green check for yes and the red X for no, then I'll give you just a few seconds. A MOOC lurker, I'm, I have been too. I just haven't had the opportunity to participate in some of them. But I know there have been some fantastic ones started by... Uh, Alec Kuros and the gang and um, some, some of the folks over at EdTech Talk. So go ahead and click the green check for yes, the red X for no. Hopefully you should have found that. And if not, uh, you can just type it in the chat. And I'm going to go ahead and post those results for us. And it looks like about Kind of, kind of even. 38% have not participated in a MOOC yet, and about 32% have. And maybe the others haven't have haven't found the way to vote yet, or weren't available to. So I'm going to go ahead and clear the results, and we'll go on to the next polling question. 
And are you a maker? Are you somebody who is what they consider to be a make? Yes, Dave Cormier. And that's who I was trying to remember. Um, who was an also one of the, the the founders? And what do you plan to make this summer? If you could just type your answer in the chat, you're not going to be um, t writing on the whiteboard. Just some of the things that you're going to make um, could be crafts, it could be technology projects, uh, lesson plans. T-shirts, whatever you're going to make. So go ahead and vote if you're a maker. And then type in the chat what you plan to make. Kind of a dual option here. Oh, Captivate Courses. That's great, Lori. And it looks like it's going to be a pretty overwhelming that most of us in here are going to be making something of some sort this summer. About 47%. Math vocabulary. Oh, that's great using your live scribe pen. So I'm going to go ahead and clear the poll results and we'll go on to the next one. Have you heard of connected learning? If you have, click on the green check. And if you've not heard of connected learning, you're not quite sure what that term means. If you'll click on the red S, and then I'll give you a few seconds to vote just below your name. You may have heard, like, or no, you may have heard uh, the term, but you're not exactly sure what is it's referring to. So let's go ahead and get those results. And we have about 15% that aren't sure or have not heard the term, and about 50% that have heard the term and are familiar with connected learning. So it's going to be great for our participants today and our speakers today to talk about connected learning. And the last question is, have you participated in any crowdfunding projects? If you have, click the green check. If you're not certain what crowdfunding is, um, you can click the red X. I know with the Genius Hour, there have been some. Uh, I think Kiva might be one of those. But if you're not certain of the term, you might want to click the red X, and then we'll have that term explained to us by our guest today. And let me get the results and show how everybody voted. And it looks like about 47% of us may not be certain or have not participated in any type of crowdfunding project, and about 21% have. So that would be great for our participants uh, to know and to be aware of when they use those terms. And we want to let you know that this again is Saturday. We're on um, June 15th, and we're going to be talking about the summer of making and connecting with our special guests, Christina Cantrell, Paulo, Paul Allison, Karen Fossenpour, and um, right now, I'm going to turn it over to Karen to introduce our very special guest today and then to introduce and discuss the newbie question of what is connected learning. So, Karen, welcome all of our special guests and over to you, Karen. Great. Thanks so much, Kim. Um, I'm Karen Fassenpower, and I will just apologize in advance if I drop out or go chipmunky because we had some stormy weather here last night and my internet got taken out by some lightning so I'm at a very kind neighbor's house and hoping this all works out. Um, I am an educator, online community facilitator um, and writer. I live in a very rural part of Arizona and I am a huge fan of the National Writing Project and doing lots of fun things with them um, this summer 
and with me are, are three other people who have the, have the pleasure of getting to work with this amazing community of educators with the National Writing Project. Christina Cantrell is the Senior Program Associate for National Programs, and she co-directs the Na National Writing Project Digital Is initiative. And we can put a link in the chat. It's digitalis.nwp.org. And that is a great place to go learn about um, different initiatives, blog, contribute content, and just really get to interact with this great community. Um, also with us is Paul O. Oh, he's a senior program associate with National Writing Project. Um, he's a former classroom teacher, and he's involved in the Writing Project's di digital literacy programs, as well as CL MOOC, which we're all working on and going to be talking uh, more about today. And finally, Paul Allison is an English teacher in the Bronx. He's a tech liaison and connected learning ambassador for the New York City Writing Project. And he is the co-founder of Youth Voices, which is a phenomenal project, which we will also be talking about more today. And I'm going to turn it over now to Christina to talk about what is connected learning. Great. Thank you, Karen. Um, and thank you so much, Kim, and for that wonderful introduction. It was wonderful to see how you facilitate this space. Um, and Peggy for inviting us in here. So we really appreciate this opportunity to talk about the Summer of Making and Connecting. Um, we are super excited about the Summer of Making and Connecting, I would say. And um, I feel like you know, that excitement comes through even on the chat here, you know, this sort of idea that as educators we are makers and we're making meaning and we're making things and it's really um, pretty exciting uh, to think about together. So um, I uh, was going to just talk um, a little bit about um, connected learning and um, just I'm, um, as Karen said, I work for the National Writing Project and it's really my great honor to work with all these educators and, and my colleagues here and really explore these ideas of connected learning together. Um, we've been exploring them for many years, not necessarily calling them connected learning, but really thinking about how digital media is um, supporting and changing our thinking about literacy learning in general. and. Um, Usually when I start a discussion about connected learning, I ask people first to think about what does connected learning mean to you? Um, so you can look at this infographic and think about that answer. There isn't a right answer and you don't have to technically know what it means, but maybe you could pick like one word and put it in the chat. What does connected learning mean to you? So there's the, that phrase, those ideas, what do they mean to you? What do they bring up? So if you pick one word and um, put it in the chat and I think that will start to kick us off. Networking shared. Great. Thanks. So I think that as you guys are doing that, I think that um, one of the reasons that I really do prompt this is because I think um, uh, particularly as educators, we really know a lot about connected learning actually. Um, and at the same time, as people in the world today and in a rapidly changing world, we also have a lot we still need to know about connected learning. So I say those things both at the same time. Um, connected learning is really about thinking about learning. It has a rich history that's um, anchored in teaching and learning theory over time in the social and cultural practices. Um, at the same time, we're in a rapidly changing, increasingly networked and connected world. So what does it mean to be connected today? What does it mean to be learners today? Um, at the Writing Project, we often ask, what, is it, what does literacy mean today? Um, so it's a very active inquiry and question within our network. Um, I think Paul O is going to talk a little bit more about our network in particular, um, so I won't really focus on that. But I did want to um, thank you all for for these words, passion driven, collaborative, global, social learning. I think um, you know, we all have a sense of this, so maybe we can dig into it a little bit here together. Um, I was just going to put in a, a video in the chat and I wouldn't, um, I'm not recommending necessarily going to this now, but it's a, a, an animated keynote by, um, of a keynote John Seeley Brown did. And it doesn't talk about John, uh, connected learning per se, it really, I think, describes um, the world that we find ourselves in today. And I'm sure that all of you at Classroom 2.0 have really been thinking about this world, uh, one that's rapidly changing, 
And this, this is the sort of larger context for this work. So I offer the video just as a resource. It's probably in the live binder already, knowing that Peggy's been, you know, doing such a great job with that. And, um, and it might be a resource of interest to you after our chat today. So let me just talk about the connected learning framework as put forward by the MacArthur Foundation. Um, so this infographic that you see here was um, uh, introduced after several years of um, MacArthur Foundation's digital media and learning initiative. Um, this work of connected learning and, um, and surfacing of principles that were then called connected learning um, happened through that digital media learning work. And um, this infographic was named and these principles set forth in March of 2012. Um, the National Learning Project has been part of this work for several years, which also involved a range of scholars, researchers, practitioners. And um, this framework is really, um, really just that, a framework. It's not a new um, box. I don't, I believe, I think we have to work for it not to be a box. It's um, also uh, not a new rubric. It's, it's really a framework and approach to learning. Um, that surfaced from research that was being done and what practitioners were learning in the field. Um, and it's an approach where the nodes of a learner's network, whether they're in school, at home, within peer spaces, or in communities, are more connected and more interdependent than not. Um, so specifically, um, the origins of it um, come, uh, are very much influenced by a three-year ethnographic study. Um, led by Mimi Ito and others who are looking at the ways that young people um, have been effectively leveraging new digital and network technologies um, and looking at those, the way that those young people were learning. Um, and so what they saw were the ways that youth were pursuing interests. They were connecting to their interests. They were connecting to peer and social communities and then also engaging in rich and often academically or potentially academically connected practices um, and also community-based practices. Um, they were using technology in very innovative ways related to their own learning and it was supporting them in being very successful in their pursuits in a range of ways. So Mimi talks about, you know, some uh, youth that were fan fiction writers, some who were youth activists and youth organizers, um, some people, some youth who were gamers and game makers, web developers, and digital media artists. Um, so a range of work that people were doing online, a range of communities that they connected to, a range of ways that they supported their own learning and connected to larger communities around them. So. Um, Looking at this work and then seeing, you know, at the National Writing Project, too, um, teachers such as uh, Paul Allison and the folks who have been working on the Youth Voices work have been um, both noticing how they are starting to learn in these connected ways online and also thinking with students about how do we learn in these connected ways um, and watching their students learn. Um, uh, bringing all this together sort of helped to surface these, these sets of principles. And the question that really is at the forefront of these sets of principles is uh, what, how are these experiences for learners and these opportunities and supports, how can they be made more widely available so that more learners can have access to these interest-driven learning opportunities and the uh, uh, higher order skills that, that, that accompany them um, and ways so that they can thrive and be sex successful in this, in today's world, in this sort of rapidly changing networked world. So um, just sort of briefly running through um, this infographic and then I'll, I'll um, stop in case there's questions or someone else wants to interject something. Um, so this graphic describes um, uh, sort of a set of three design principles, a set of three learning principles, and then a set of three values. Um, so let's start with peer culture or peer supported. So this idea is that, you know, and it really surfaced in Mimi Ito's work, is that in everyday exchanges with peers, um, young people are contributing and sharing and giving feedback um, in the report they say in inclusive social experiences that are fluid and highly engaging. 
And in the um, and in the research that they did, they found that kids, they have this phrase called homago, so it's hanging out, messing around, and geeking out. <laughs> and they found that those were all really important aspects of how peers learn together. And um, then a question comes from that, how can you design spaces where kids have the opportunity to hang out, to mess around, to geek out, and sort of those to be fluid spaces where they can learn and do and support each other as peers. Um, and I think this is interesting too in the context of the National Writing Project, which is also a peer-based community. So even among adults, what are the peer learning spaces? Um, then uh, interest powered, um, that's another key piece here. Um, and uh, what they found is that, um, and I think a lot of us know this, right, that when um, something is personally interesting and personally relevant to a learner, um, all of us as learners um, can be much more successful. Um, and an interesting um, nuance, I think, to this idea of interest powered is that, um, you know, often we think of interests as passions and things you love and things you like to do, but, um, or things you're curious about, but, but often interests are also political. So um, what is your, your political interest in this situation? What is your community's political interest in this situation? So that's an important part of a connected learning ecosystem, I would say. Um, and the fact that uh, pa interest powered is really, you know, that, that fact that it's powered by this um, is a key idea. Academically oriented then, or academic, I think um, really represents um, connections to larger systems. Um, and we've been doing some work, the National Writing Project, and Paul O can talk about this more, but we're doing some work in um, the Oakland Unified School District. Um, that's really not just about connecting to larger systems within schools, but, but about civic engagement too. That there are these larger systems that youth interests can be connected to um, to promote their own academic work and studies and goals, to, to actively engage in their communities, and then um, also to build career opportunities and um, connect to larger economic uh, systems. So, um, so that's what that aspect of that work is really about. Um, and then uh, uh, I take you up to the upper left hand corner of this production centered focus. So um, we, I mean that's part of what the summer of making and connecting is really about um, is really um, exploring what does it mean when we become creators and not just consumers of content. And we all know very well how digital tools can provide numerous opportunities for us to be consumers. And we could, you know, potentially consume all day if we weren't really watching ourselves. And that, you know, actually they also, but when you pay attention to those tools, they actually can be used in ways to create and the internet is entirely created. Um, so how do we become creators? And that really at a forefront of being an active and engaged cultural um, participant. Uh, shared purpose is then also a really big piece of that and um, an affordance of digital technologies that I think is part of like the, um, what, you know, there's sort of unprecedented opportunities now for us to connect um, over social media and across web-based communities. Um, and then this is kind of connected to this idea of openly networked. So um, I think that uh, we have unprecedented ways to network with each other that we never had before and what does it mean to do that, do those, that networking in the open and what are the uh, affordances and um, opportunities of that. And then also what does openly networked teach us about ways to be openly networked offline that there's actually a lot to, to pay attention to there, um, I would say. So, um, uh, just to wrap up real fast, um, the um, embodied values of connected um, learning and the, the values behind these principles to really focus on equity, social belonging, and participation. And um, I, uh, these are all really core and interesting in their own right. And um, I would just bring your attention to a report that came out um, in 2013 called Ad Ad Connected Learning and Agenda for Research and um, uh, Action, Research and Design, I'm sorry. 
um, that really focuses, it has a very strong focus on equity and really how do we, you know, key question about how do we bring these opportunities um, increasingly to um, more and more learners. So um, the report, I would say, just has a lot of really interesting examples of connected learning um, from places like the Harry Potter Alliance, which is much more of a sort of grassroots organized um, activist group connected to a fan community. Um, it includes examples like U Media, um, which is um, based a teen center for media creation based in the library in Chicago, and then things like Quest to Learn, which are school-based examples, and really sort of rethink ways to connect schools and communities and civic engagement. Um, and then in our NWP work, we um, have really been um, examining connected learning too. I, I haven't been able to follow the chat, but I can see that several people um, who have been involved in a lot of our um, uh, inquiry into connected learning have joined us here. So I'm sure they have many things to share. Um, and uh, we're really looking at um, uh, as a, a network that connects kindergarten through university educators increasingly inside outside of school. What does connecting look like uh, for us as a community? What does it look like in our classrooms? What does it look like in our communities and across institutional spaces? So I, I have a few examples I could share about that, but I wanted to just stop for a second and see if there are any um, uh, questions or any of my colleagues want to jump in and add something. Christina, this is Paul O. I just wanted to say a couple of things in relation to what you brought up. Uh, so mm -hmm. first of all, I'll just say that there have been some great, there's been great conversation in the chat space, and I just wanted to get this on record, some of these ideas. Um, so for instance, Stella, who I don't know, but who's in Argentina, um, makes the statement, learning is ubiquitous and multi-oriented and restructures itself every second all over the world. I would say that in some sense, I mean, in many respects, that's an embodiment, you know, that statement, I think, of connected learning principles. The other thing that I wanted to say really quickly is that I think that the, the so, so I think of the connected learning principles as a way to consider how one might design um, an ecosystem uh, for these kinds of learning opportunities. And as well, I think it's also a way to notice um, the ecosystem as it's developing, or to notice how youth are learning. So going back to that ethnographic study, and Joe Dillon also pointed to this in the chat, and I think it's absolutely true. You know, a story that I often think about um, when I think about connected learning is uh, many of you have probably either had the same experience or heard this story told by Will Richardson about how he, um, you know, understood the power of openly networked by watching his kids interact with each other as they were trying to solve uh, problems with regard to Minecraft. You know, they were able to get online and find peers with whom to interact. And they had this wealth of knowledge at their fingertips through the internet, through their peer interactions that wasn't mediated by school. And so this is not to say that school doesn't play a role, but I, I think it, it illustrates this, this broad sense of uh, the, the, the nodes, as you talked about, um, all these learning opportunities both in school and out. So th those are the couple of um, little stories that I wanted to, to put around your description of connected learning. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, another example that um, sort of making this sort of in-school and out-of-school connection. Um, colleagues of ours this summer are actually right now working on a um, project that, oh, Karen, did you raise your hand? Do you want to say something? I did. Sorry. I didn't want to interrupt, but I just want to bring up um, one question from the chat that came up from someone who said they'd like to be a part of a writing project, and could someone tell them more? So maybe either Christina or Paul, you could say just a little bit about how people might get involved, because we're having a lot of chat about how great writing projects and how many of us have had such good experience. All right. So how would someone new get involved? OK. So let me use this example to sort of try to bridge to that a little bit. And then, Paul, maybe you could pick that up with a little bit more detail. Um, so, uh, in, so in writing projects, um, they're locally based. Um, they're university school connections in local communities, and there's about 200 around the country. 
right now, one of ours um, that is in Fort Collins, Colorado, at the Colorado State University Writing Project, is running a, um, a multiple week uh, program for English uh, fourth grade ELL students. Um, and they are working to use digital tools um, to save stories of un underrepresented uh, Latino community members in their Fort Collins area. And then um, bring, put these stories into um, uh, build them into projects that can then be shared in museums and community spaces. So um, it's a very powerful project that the kids are engaged in in their local communities. And then um, teachers are, have a concurrent professional development workshop um, where they are working together, um, uh, practicing teachers, pre-service teachers, university researchers, working with the kids and then and working with the community members and then thinking about this kind of learning through a connected learning framework. Um, so that's one um, place that we're starting to, you know, we, we, we are using this framework to sort of look at the work that we're doing and think about how do we be a little bit more openly networked? How do, you know, how do we push on the openly networked aspects? How do we push and like really fully support the clear and shared purpose that's happening here? How do we really support the kids in diving, digging in and connecting to their interests? Um, and then also thinking about what's the teacher's role in all that work and um, what are these questions that the educators and how can we support and for and help the kids make the connection with the community. And so that's, a, that's an example of the kind of work that might happen in a local community and sometimes these opportunities are open to local educators so that's one way to connect with the writing project too. That segue helps you Paul, sorry. <laughs> Um, but maybe, Paul, do you want to pick that up? Sure, yes. Uh, so pick up about the National Writing Project? Uh, sure, if that feels right to you. We can go back to some examples, but maybe we can go into the Writing Project and the summer ahead because those are also opportunities for people to connect. Oh, yes, sure. Oh, the summer of making and connecting. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't following. I was, I was uh, I'm chatting, so. Uh, You're chatting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I would say that the summer of making and connecting, I'll, I'll say very quickly that the summer of making and connecting is, I, I think of it as an event uh, that focuses on relevance for today's youth and learning that taps creative potential and higher order skills in situations both formal and formal. And this kind of learning approach uh, is really based on connected learning principles. So under the Summer of Making and Connecting Umbrella, there are hundreds of organizations and individuals, as Christina has talked about, formal teachers and informal educators, you know, parents, guardians, museum educators, librarians, across the nation and across the world, actually, who will be creating things. Um, and we have a number of um, major partners under the, the, the Summer of Making and Connecting Umbrella. Uh, and those are the MacArthur Foundation, the National Writing Project, and the Mozilla Foundation. And so the, the National Writing Project has launched its educator-facing strand of the Summer of Making and Connecting, and that's called Educator Innovator. And the Mozilla Foundation today, I believe, although I haven't seen any indication of it yet come through my inbox, they're launching their um, primarily youth-facing uh, portion of the Summer of Making and Connecting, and that's uh, Maker Party 2013. So essentially, uh, we have invited our network of writing project sites and other educators to take part in the summer of making and connecting. And again, when I say educators, I mean educators writ large. So anyone who essentially self-identifies as an educator. And uh, the idea behind this uh, movement is to really focus on this idea of making, this production-centered piece that is in some senses at the heart of the connected learning principle. I shouldn't say that, but, but it is an important and critical element of the connected learning principles. So focusing on making and the maker movement. Um, and, you know, it was great to see all of you uh, describe yourselves as makers because I think that that is true. And I would just add, this is my own personal editorial in, in interjection, that I think uh, teachers are uh, in many respects, the most creative makers that I've ever come across, uh, often very creative, really, um, you know, interest-driven people in their lives outside of school. 
And I think at times, um, depending on our circumstances, that creative impulse is, is often pushed to the side for whatever reason. And I think what, what is really, to me, exciting about this summer is it's a chance for, for we as educators to come together um, as a community of peers to really surface that creative impulse that we have. So I would say that that's at the heart of the summer of making and connecting. And I would uh, just also say that as part of the summer of making and connecting, um, that we, um, as I said, have this educator innovator initiative. Um, and that educator innovator initiative is one in which we have a number of partners who have come together. And you can see just a, a small sampling of them on this slide uh, to, to offer to educators a whole set of opportunities um, that are occurring this summer. And they all have, again, some kind of connected learning uh, focus. Um, so everybody from EdCamp, this idea of, of uh, educators um, in an unconference way sharing their practice with one another, um, not mediated uh, by um, you know, corporations or publishing companies. Um, the Maker Ed Initiative, which is the education arm of the, of the Maker Movement of Make Magazine, Edutopia. I mean, you can see these and go to the website and see the whole range of partners. Um, and, and it's been this uh, incredible, I think, coming together of like-minded organizations. And I would say, as well, we have writing project um, offerings as well. So Troy Hicks is going to be talking about his new book uh, in a webinar that's coming up on Tuesday. And the thing that I would say about Educator Innovator is that um, it is both, you know, at this sort of broader level, this idea of a network of, you know, educators, a network of networks. But then, you know, on the ground, and we'll hear some more about this um, coming up, but on the ground, there's a whole range of projects um, and activities that are happening in, uh, at least this summer at writing project sites, for instance, around the country. Um, we heard the other day from Cindy O'Donnell Allen, as I think you referenced, Christina, uh, about work that's happening in Colorado and uh, Fort Collins, where youth, um, and I believe they're Latino youth, uh, who are working in partnership with a museum to essentially understand and insert their history in the community into the museum display. It's, uh, it's called Save Our Stories. So that's one example of this amazingly powerful project that is really fueled by connected learning principles, this idea of, of um, a learning opportunity in which youth are producing and connecting with an out of school um, or an informal educational setting. Uh, that's one example. and. Um, we, you can find more information about that work at the Digital Is website because there's been a lot of documentation there. Um, I think coming up, uh, we're going to hear from Paul Allison talking about youth voices. But I want to say also just really quickly, um, and again, this is maybe a little bit tangential, but you know, I, I happened to be at, um, I was having lunch actually with uh, someone that, with the executive director of National Novel Writing Month, the former National Writing Project. Um, person, so a colleague and a friend, and he had with him someone from National Novel Writing Month, which if you're not familiar with that, you should look it up. It's a great possibility. They're actually a partner in um, Educator Innovator, and, uh, and one of his colleagues at National Novel Writing Month over lunch was talking to me about something that she created, actually, essentially out of thin air. It's um, called Invisible City Audio Tours. And basically, what she and some artist friends decided to do was to create um, an opportunity for people to follow an audio tour. They have made a map of different places. Um, I happen to live in Oakland, and they one of their first audio tours was in Oakland. And they've created this like fictional history of their community, or it's this blend of, of actual history, but fiction you know, as well. And so they've create and and they're moving into geocaching. And so they've created this whole um, project 
that is based on like their imagination um, that is like essentially place-based fiction. And, uh, but that also involves you walking around the place in which you live. And so I, I feel like that's the other piece to this too. It's both what's happening, you know, in formal education settings, but it's also what, you know, what happens when our imagination is unleashed and our creative impulse, as I said, is unleashed. Um, I feel like that's to me the, 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 the beauty of the educator innovator uh, movement. And so I believe I am now going to turn this over to Karen, I think, to talk a little bit about making learning connected. Unless anyone has any, um, any questions. Great. Thanks, Paul. So I'm going to just give a quick um, introduction to the Making Learning Connected um, MOOC, which is what we've been talking about in the chat as CL MOOC. And I'm going to kind of go quickly through the basics of this because I want to make sure we have time to talk about Youth Voices um, with Paul Allison. Um, but definitely um, ask questions in the chat and we'll catch up. Um, CL MOOC is, um, it's, first of all, it starts today, so we're very excited. Um, it has a team of just fabulous people facilitating it. Um, and several of the people are online with us today, Chad Sansing and Joe Dillon. And Paul and Christina and I are all working on it. Paul Allison is an advisor. Um, and we've been really working hard to make a MOOC that is really more of a collaboration than a course. And we think that's really important because we really, I think MOOC, the term MOOC has started to mean so many things. And there's really a rich history of MOOCs being collaborative. But now some of the sort of more corporate players have moved in. And a lot of people think of MOOCs as um, what we were talking about in the chat room is just like a experience where you're in the back of a lecture hall with 10,000 people and you don't, you can't connect with anybody. And we, we don't want our MOOC to be that. Our MOOC is all about connecting and really it's about um, finding the path and finding the experiences in the MOOC that work for you. So it's, it's very, very flexible and I would invite anybody to come participate, um, whether you're new to this whole area or whether you've been doing, you're a maker and you've been doing connected learning and you're in really deep with it, I think that there's something for everybody in this MOOC and I would just really encourage people to find a path that works for you in this MOOC and don't feel like you have to do everything but find the pieces that work. Um, some of the activities that will be a part of this MOOC is we'll be having some, some synchronous activities, like we'll have a Thursday night um, Twitter chat, and the hashtag is CLMOOC, so if you're on Twitter, definitely look at CLMOOC and see. Um, there's a G Plus community, which we posted the link for in the chat. There'll be um, connected learning TV webinars. Um, a lot of the activities in the MOOC are going to be focused around making and looking at the connected learning principles. So we'll have um, some suggested makes for each part of the MOOC. Um, but what we really want is for people to come up with their own makes. And we even have um, something called a make bank where you can post your own ideas for things to make. And that could be anything from making in a digital environment, like doing Minecraft or Scratch, to making in the physical world, like um, building a woodworking project or doing gardening. Um, writing is also making. And there's just an infinite number of possibilities. Um, so again, the MOOC starts today and it'll run through August 2nd, so it's seven weeks. Um, and we can, we, if we have a little bit of time at the end, we might talk about sort of some ideas of ways people could get started on this. But I would say if you're new to MOOCs and you're not sure where to start, um, the G Plus community will be a really good place to start. Um, and also just try to connect with some other people in the MOOC. And whether that's through the G Plus community or on Twitter or really, I would say whatever spaces you're in um, online, people will be there from CL MOOC. So I certainly um, extend an invitation um, to anybody to connect with me if you're new to this or you feel like you, know, you want sort of some connection and support. Um, to me, that's sort of the best way to get started. Um, so I'm going to just turn it over. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of catch up in chat, but I'm going to turn it over now to Paul Allison to give a description of the Youth Voices Project, which I think is just 
an awesome example of connected learning and something that um, everyone can get involved in with their students. So Paul? Thanks, Karen. Um, and thank you all for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, amazing group of people. Um, I, you know, um, I wanted to jump on the idea of how to get started on that MOOC. And, it, and as I was this morning trying to figure out, you know, the make I'm going to make, it got really complicated and I started thinking, um, you know, uh, I, I should put it up unfinished. Um, so I, that's one thing I think is really important. And it's something we've learned on Youth Voices too, that things don't have to be perfect before they get thrown into the community. So I would encourage people to join that way um, as well. Back on slide 14, the, that, that infographic about um, connected learning, some in the boxes, the openly, and somebody tell me, is this value or I think it is, uh, or <laughs> principal, I'm not sure which it is, but the openly networked shared purpose um, production-centered um, boxes, the purple boxes there, I think are re were really important in, in, in thinking about what Youth Voices was. And it started 10, maybe a little bit longer years ago in a national writing project um, meeting where we were bringing people from all over the United States uh, um, together um, for a, a short time. And, and people wanted to, it was really production centered. People wanted to figure out how can we start it as a podcasting place? How can we um, get youth voices out to, um, out to other people so that they can, they can hear these wonderful things our, our students are doing in our classes? So, it, um, but it quickly, so worth saying at that point, many of us had our own individual blogs in our classrooms. And we even had some experiments where people tried to, between various local and national writing project sites, shared and so forth um, together, shared their blogs together. But we started to think we really need a site where um, they're, they're not individual blogs, where, where it's a social network where a lot of kids can participate from all over the place. Um, so it, it quickly became a place where there was shared purpose. And we kept it, we always kept it openly networked. Um, and I'm curious to hear more what, what, what Christina was thinking about um, offline openly networked. But it may seem like a bit of a risk, but a very important principle of Youth Voices is that, that you can join right now as a teacher. You're, you can put some students in, uh, and then on, on Monday morning, um, they can start publishing right on the site. So, um, and, and you'll get a quick email from me saying, now that you're a teacher on the site, you're, you've got to help us administer this site too. Um, so it's that kind of um, shared work that we do together on the site. So what's happened over the 10 years is, is that, uh, you know, lots of people have tried lots of different things and we every once in a while try to codify those. Um, there are guides to help kids with writing. There are missions which try to um, capture some of the projects that different teachers do. And um, yeah, so that's, that's some of what, uh, that's a quick introduction to Youth Voices. I, I always say, and I think it's worth saying, um, is that we're a community. Um, we're not uh, uh, of teachers who work together. A lot of us do come from New York City. I'm uh, 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 work here in New York City with the New York City Writing Project, um, but a lot of people come from there, um, from out uh, over the United States, and there's one person uh, from uh, down in Buenos Aires who joins us as well. And we'd love to have more international um, people on the site. Um, so, where do we go next here? <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about the Youth Voices Summer Project because this is a project um, that we that Paul and others are working on right now to try to extend the experience of Youth Voices um, beyond the school year into the summer. And we are currently working on um, funding that, which leads into some of the cr crowdfunding right. um, discussions. So, I'll, Paul, tell a little bit about about the vision wow. for Youth Voices Summer. Yeah, sorry about the music in the background. Um, I don't know if you can hear it, but um, the uh, so it's outside. The um, Youth Voices Summer Program is um, 
is going to be, we're bringing together 15 students and we've actually uh, sifted through about 30 or 40 applications which has been really interesting to do and we're calling parents and stuff tonight and tomorrow and, and so we're, it's coming together which is really exciting. So it's 15 students, five teachers will be um, sometimes sitting with students, sometimes not sitting with, with the students. We're still trying to figure out all the different combinations that that can happen. Um, but what will be exciting is that the 15 students will go back to their classrooms. Um, in many cases, there will be a New York City Writing Project uh, consultant working in those schools with those teachers. So whatever we do in the summer, we'll have legs um, into the fall and, and so forth. Um, very important is we're starting with, with students' interests, their passions, and we're trying to give them three weeks of just uh, going with wherever they'd like to go with that. Um, so that's some of it. <laughs> so it's 15, 15 students, uh, five teachers. We didn't have enough funding. Um, and there, I was reflecting um, recently with somebody that there were many points in the planning process that started months and months ago where we could have said no, but we really do believe in giving kids this opportunity to kind of go with their passions, have some freedom in the summer, but also some support to create things that are, are wonderful and connected with other people um, through Youth Voices. Um, so we've been f pushing forward. Um, and the other, another part of it I'll, I'll mention very quickly um, is, is open badges. Last year we created, um, uh, thank you, <laughs> we, we created um, open badges and um, in, in my own school, um, really across the curriculum, uh, mainly in English, but we, we, we figured out um, some competencies that we would attach to badges. We call them challenges. Um, and, um, and as students complete those challenges on different levels, they eventually receive a credit. So it's really connected to credit. Um, there's some wonderful, more open um, thinking around open badges that, that it's very exciting to learn from. Um, and so what we'd like to do this summer is uh, turn our system that we designed last summer into a system using P2PU's new um, open badges system. To, um, to work with students to design their own badges as they describe their, their growth and process this summer. So all of that will be happening um, while there's also this uh, you know, New York City Writing Project Summer Institute that's happened um, um, for 35 years um, at Lehman College. So it'll be great to have those teachers nearby as well. And Karen's going to be joining us, so I'm so excited about that. So. <laughs> Somebody else jump in here. <laughs> oh, the crowdfunding. Was that clear enough? Um, we, we haven't reached our goal yet. Let me, let me just say that. I, we'd love for you to vote for us, and there are other, um, other Writing Project uh, folks on this Project Connect um, competition to vote for. I, I actually think commenting on, on um, the bottom of ours is even more valuable. Um, there, at the bottom, if you make a comment about the potential of open badges and youth designing them, that would be a really helpful thing for all of us, whether or not we get the funding for that. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're going to go ahead with the program. We haven't reached our goals in every every place, but we, we're piecing together money from all over the place. We'd still love for you to contribute. Um, if you go to incited.org, I-N-C-I-T-E-D.org, and you can find the Youth Voices Project there. There are also other great projects there. The incited um, folks, you, um, Peggy and Kim, you guys should have them on sometime to, to just talk about what they're trying to do. Um, I think it's a really interesting thing. Um, most of us are familiar with other kinds of uh, crowdfunding, Kickstarter, for example. But it's, it's, when we looked at Kickstarter, it was hard to um, figure out what category we fit into. So um, it was nice to find this site, which is really all about education. So. That's a lot that I just said. Somebody else should pick up here. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Paul. So I do yeah. think we've learned a lot about the whole crowdfunding thing. And it's, I think it's great to have different opportunities like this to look for funding for our projects. Um, but I would say I'm coming away from the crowdfunding thinking it's 
harder than I thought it was going to be. But we do, um, we've raised $4,500 online through Incited, and we've gotten a couple of um, big offline donations, which we greatly appreciate. Um, that so wouldn't again, have happened without the online thing. Yeah, so absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it, that's been one really interesting thing is just seeing the ripple effect. And I think for me, one of the exciting things about the crowdfunding is that it's been an opportunity for me to get people that I know personally that aren't in education to get them supporting education and seeing some really positive things that are happening with education. And I would say people have been really excited. You know, it's hard. It's hard to ask people for money. And in some ways, it's harder to ask them for money for something than it is like selling magazines or something. But, but several people I know have said, oh, I'd much rather give money to a really a good project that I know somebody who's involved with rather than buying candy or magazines that I don't really want anyway. And not all the money goes to the to the program. In this, you know, all the money is going to go into the kids. So um, we're really excited about that. And if you can support or spread the word about that, please do. We have five days left in our crowdfunding campaign. And then also um, the the DML project. And Youth Voices is, is in this competition, but there are a number of other national writing project um, or, write, or local writing project projects that are in this DML competition. And you can vote. Um, I think today's the last day to vote. Want. Yep. So today if you're going to do day? that vote today. Yes. Okay, yep. great. So Jeff has a contribution or a question that says he wants to contribute, but it, does he have to join? On Incited, you, you have to just sign up for their site, and then you pay through PayPal. So, and that's the way their site is set up right now. Their site is in a beta, and they're looking at adding other features um, because I know PayPal is sometimes. You have to have a PayPal account that you can pay with a credit card. And I know for some people that's been challenging. Um, for Youth Voice of Summer, you can also mail in a check if you like. And that information is on the Incited page, or you could contact Paul or I. And I've even, um, this is one of the really unexpected things to me. I've even had a few people, um, just friends, who've given me cash. And they, you know, I had somebody come over for dinner, and they said, "Oh, that sounds like a great project. You know, here's 25 bucks." And so I just put it on my PayPal account. So we're trying to make it as flexible for people um, as it can be. And I think that's, you know, that's a key to any kind of fundraising. But it's been a really fun experience. And obviously, you can hear I love Youth Voices and I love Writing Project. And so. Um, yeah, so another comment is no PayPal, is it really safe? And you know, the incited people have a lot of documentation on their site about how safe PayPal is and don't worry about it. And Kim says it's absolutely safe. But I know like people, some of the people that I in particular, I always give my, my mother as an example. You know, everybody doesn't want to have a login on PayPal and deal with all that. So we've tried to provide other ways um, to do it. But I, I certainly use PayPal and haven't had a problem. But I think, you know, that's a choice everybody has to make for themselves. And I do know that Incited is planning a credit card, in the future is planning a credit card pay option where you don't have to go through PayPal. So, you know, there's some advantages um, to them to go through it. But they're trying to open up options as well. So I think at this point, um, we're winding down in our time. But if anybody has questions, or Paul, did you want to make another point? I was just going to say that for, from the perspective of somebody who might want to run a campaign, I just want to emphasize again, what it's helped us do is clarify. Um, you know, when you have to explain why you want money from people, you have to say what you're doing. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, a really, it's been a really good thing for the team to clarify what we're doing and why we're doing it. So it does all that. <laughs> But the questions so, now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let's do let's do questions. And I don't know, Kim. I know you have a few wrap up things. And then I think um, if people have additional questions, we can stay around as we're winding up the hour. We can stay past that. And I just really appreciate the opportunity for us to be here with all you. And I think with that, I'll turn it over to Kim or Peggy. Yes, I'll go ahead and take over. Uh, one question I saw is the maker movement founded in Montessori Reggio models. So this is Paul O. I'll jump in and I'll say uh, I don't know um, how to describe the origins of the maker movement other than that um, Dale Darty uh, was uh, who is the the 
he's um, from O'Reilly, and he um, is the, the founder of Make Magazine. He, I think, really uh, was at the forefront of a certain wave of the bringing back of um, Make kinds of work. And I think he had very much a digital focus. Uh, I, I believe that really what the Make movement is capitalizing on is, is really a cultural phenomenon um, that, I, I mean, I see at least in the places where I live that uh, the idea of, of building and doing with your hands, um, but also the, this digital component and doing it in community is becoming more popular. So I would say that that's true, but I think as Christina was pointing out, I think that there's a long and rich history, um, and this is what John C. Lee Brown, I think, talks about. So I, I don't know that there's a direct connection between, um, necessarily between, say, connected learning principles and the production-centered values of making with um, the Montessori, um, Maria Montessori work, but the connections are there because I think it's, it's all part of the same um, pathway with regard to understanding uh, that uh, youth making and constructing knowledge and paying attention to that is is what we um, uh, can really benefit from as educators. Great. Thank you for answering that. That was the only question that I saw that wasn't answered, but we'll come back to questions. It is the top of the hour. We understand that people do have to leave, but if you have time, we invite you to stay on and we'll go back to answering questions in just a bit. We want to let you know that Steve Hargadon uh, will, <clears throat> that our schedule next week, we won't have a session. The ISTE event, the Hack Education Unconference Day, will be occurring so we will, uh, in San Antonio, so we will not have a show next Saturday, but we will return. <clears throat> and then we'll be talking, um, I thought it was the 30, on the 29th, we'll be talking with Tia Cooper. We've had her on before, and she's great with STEM. And this time we'll be talking about infusing technology with the Common Core standard. And then July 6th or 27th, we're going to take a summer break. And then we will return on August 3rd so that we can be talking about some of the things and getting ready for the new school year. I can't believe it's going by so quickly. And this is the slide from the Live Binders contest that I mentioned. The contest ends, uh, you can vote until the 16th. And then on Wednesday, June the 19th, there will be a webinar here in this room. And you can, they will announce the winners. And uh, our, one of our live finders was picked. And I'll go ahead and pass it to Peggy to add some comments to this. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I put this slide in and also a link in the live binder because they actually have a live binder prepared for you to go and vote. And you can only vote once, so choose carefully. You get to pick your top ten. And what I love about this um, contest is that it provides us with a way to find the best of the best live binders to share with other people as good examples of what you can do with a live binder. You know we're very enthusiastic about live binders because they really help us share all of the resources in our webinars in one place. So I I hope you'll all take a minute, go to that tab in our live binder today, and vote for your favorites. And then there's going to be a webinar coming up on Wednesday, June 19th. It's going to be on Classroom 20 Live. The link is there in the, in the live binder, 5 o'clock Eastern Time. They will be announcing the winning top 10 live binders. And many of the people who created those live binders will be there to give you a quick tour of them. So that's a webinar you won't want to miss. Join us. And that's 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern uh, next week. So mark your calendars for that. 
And uh, there are some fantastic live binders in the live binder that you'll want to check out that are just really amazing. And now, talking about Steve Hargadon, he will be on July 2nd, after ISTE and everything has settled down, he'll be talking with Matt Hearn on de-schooling. And on July the 9th, he will be talking with Will Richardson on his new book, Y School. And uh, July the 10th, talking about self-organizing, self sorry, I'm having a problem here, learning environments with Black Mountain SOLA. So. And then he'll be talking with Do Doan Winkle on July 30th. So uh, be sure to keep those in mind. Coming up with Steve Harganon. <clears throat> And we would love for you to nominate a featured teacher for some of our future sessions. We just had our June one last week. And so we'll be looking for our August featured teachers. And the link is in the live binder and posted in the chat. So you could click on that now or access it in the live binder. Uh, you can nominate yourself or any educator that works with um, other educators and students. We'd love to always hear about new people. And when you exit today's session, a survey link will automatically open in your browser, or you can access the link in the live binder. And you can request a professional development certificate. And we would love to get your feedback on today's session, as well as topics for future sessions. And if you'd like to request a professional development certificate for today, in that survey, you can put your name and email address, and Peggy will email that out to you shortly after the session, once everybody exits and the recording process is sometimes, sometime later this weekend. Uh, yeah, so make sure that, you're, um, that your email address is correct, and you may want to use a personal email address in case a content filter blocks. Um, for some reason, we had some issues last week with our domain not being uh, familiar to that district. So you might want to use your personal email address and just make sure it is typed in correctly so that we don't have issues and you won't uh, miss out on receiving that certificate. We also have an iTunes U channel and that link is in the live binder and it's just posted in the chat so you can click on that. To subscribe to the MP3 or MP4 or if you wanted to just download an individual recording, you can also do that and keep up with it each week. We also have a blog post that we post to our website that has the same resources and recordings that were shared um, on iTunes and all of the Live Binder links posted individually. And you can subscribe through an RNA, in any RSS feed aggregator. Um, that you would like to use on our archives and resources page from our um, website and the, law, the, the link is in the chat right now and in the live binder. And we want to give a very special thank you to Christina and Paul and Paul and Karen for joining us today and talking about this fantastic opportunity to participate with students and um, Steve Harganon, who is our founder, we want to give him a special thank you. And we believe for providing our website and to each of you for contributing each week to our conversations and all of the great things that you do to help support our community and our webinars each and every week. And to Blackboard for allowing us to meet this week, each and every week in this platform. So thank you so much to everybody involved and to everybody who's joining us today. And so we'll pass it back to questions. So we'd also like to hear about some of the stories of what some of the kids and teens will be doing in the different projects this summer. So we'll pass it back to our panel, and one of them can kind of take over from there. Paul, Allison, you want to talk about just a couple examples of projects that your students are either doing or will be doing in summer? <laughs> doing or will be doing? Hmm, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's always hard because 
we start with their questions and start with their passions. So you can't predict exactly what they're going to be doing, um, and that's part of what's exciting about it. Um, we're, um, and so I'm not sure how to describe that in more detail. Um, I can say this, that, that whatever their questions are, one of the things that, one of the ways we start um, a lot of students, and most students on Youth Voices, and we'll start the teachers this way too, is by responding to somebody um, who has already uh, dealt with that question in, in some way on Youth Voices. So finding something there and, and responding will be one way. Um, we we do hope to incorporate, and we've been finding lots of uh, subtle and interesting ways to incorporate the uh, the WebMaker tools, Mozilla's WebMaker tools. Um, very simple ways to to use um, Popcorn Maker, for example, um, that we've been exploring. So we'll we'll be doing that, um, and uh, I don't know. Um, the the whole idea of the badges, and I think in general, um, whatever. Paths students create. Um, I, I joked that I want to call them bread crumbs instead of badges, so that we will be working really hard for students to document their path and then uh, make that available for other students to to follow that path themselves. So I hope that's not too vague, but that's that's some of what we're messing around with. So Christina um, mentioned the yeah. 10 self tough 10 world questions that you might yeah. want to talk about, and I was thinking about the birdhouses. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, James A. Bean is, uh, uh, I, think, I think he's from New Zealand originally. I don't know, anyway, he's an educator um, uh, who wrote um, Curriculum Integration is, is his most um, well-known book. But um, it, it, it's uh, really a way to Think about a middle school curriculum, but we've adopted it and adopted it um, at Youth Voices. We we really have kids start with um, ten questions about themselves and ten about the world, and even if we're teaching um, in a subject area, for example, um, t we still start with that just plain open questions about yourself, ten about the world, and and when you do that, when you trust that process, um, kids come up with the most amazing complex, you know interesting and, you know, useful for research questions um, that, that we then mix, you know, they, they talk to each other about those questions, um, we work with them on the questions and so forth. So starting with those questions is a really important part of it. And then starting as a responder to other things is the other important part of it that, um, that, I, that I've already said. <laughs> um, I, and you know, the, the other part that I, wa I want to emphasize is that um, there, purpose is so important in all this work, and and um, so that and and that the students find their own purpose. But the purpose might be that they're fascinated by vampires, you know, or or they might be fascinated by um, you know pollution or something. Um, so finding their own topics is important. Having said that, <laughs> um, we also have had lots of experiences with working and recent experiences with working with community-based organizations in particular. I've worked this spring with Rocking the Boat, um, which is a, an organization uh, in the Bronx, right on the Bronx River. And we've done just wonderful experiences with kids where they have built um, tree or nest boxes for, for birds, and uh, just last week we opened those nest boxes. There were ten of them originally. There were six left, um, but um, we opened them, and four out of six of them had eggs in them. And probably by this time they had little fledglings in them. So kids built the boxes uh, using power tools and so forth. Um, they put them up in the park. They learned about birds and so forth. That wasn't their passion. But because they could see the passion of the scientists and the teachers around them, they kind of uh, found their own passions within it. So there's there's some of uh, some of the, the paradoxes of, of the work we do together. <laughs> Great, thank you, Paul. And if there are any questions or comments that we might have missed, please type them in the chat, or we can give you the mic if you'd like to address the panel directly. We want to make sure that you have your opportunity. 
uh, to connect. And somebody asked, how does one join the CL MOOC? So you can go to the CL MOOC website, and we'll put a link up in the chat. And then on the right-hand side, all you have to do is just put in your email address. And that will get you um, signed up for CL MOOC. And then you will start getting emails with activities. And you can refer back to that site and lots of other resources. But basically, just go to that site and put your email address in. Great. And are there any other questions before we let the panel go to enjoy their Saturday? It would be great for our community to join with the uh, MOOC community. And Terry, Terry do you have, have a question? question? Terry, did you have a question or a comment that you wanted to share? If so, raise your hand again and I can give you the mic or you can just type it in the chat. Go ahead, Terry. You click on the talk button in the top left to activate your mic. Yes. Um, I, I really wasn't intending to ask a question. I was actually intending to clap because uh, ah, I came late yes. to this. It's just really wonderful to hear hear my friends uh, uh, talk about all of the, uh, the cool projects they're working with students, and I just want to thank you all. Well, thank you for that comment. I totally agree, and that that uh, talk uh, way or talk raise your hand button does look like the clapping uh, symbol, and that the to clap is under the emoticon. I'm not certain why they put it that way. But that's where it is if you're interested in, in checking that out. So uh That's a good accident, I like. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> because this has been a fantastic session. I think it's very motivating uh for teachers and uh it should be very exciting uh when they get back to their classrooms um or finishing out the year or doing stuff with summer programs that they're gonna be working with. And, and these are great ideas to use, especially if you're going to be uh, doing some kind of summer camp or summer program with students. So if there are no more questions, um, we are um, look forward to meeting up again one last time before summer. And if you haven't heard Tia Cooper speak, you'll definitely want to make sure to join us back on the 29th because uh, She's fantastic, has great information to share, and it's just a world of information. So we do hope to uh, see you next week or the, on the 29th, and thank you again for everybody for jo joining us today, and, and hope to see you at ISTE. Uh, it's in my hometown, so that will be very easy travel. And thank you for joining us, everybody. We'll meet at the same time on the 29th back here. And if and if you can join the Live Binder uh, webinar on the 19th, that will be great. It'll be here in the same room. So take care, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. And hopefully you have good weather. Um,